Good evening and welcome to Between the Lines. I'm John Madison. My guest tonight is Zubaydah Jaffa. She is a journalist, an author, a writer in residence at the University of the Free State and a lecturer. Uh, she's done many other things. Uh, she has uh, degrees from Rhodes University, the University of Cape Town, and a master's in journalism from Columbia University in New York. Uh, she, in, the in 1980, she was writing and winning awards for her writing about um, during the activist period on the Cape Times for which she got arrested and accused of being an activist. At the time, she wasn't, uh, but after bad treatment there, she decided she should have been, and she became an activist. In 1994, she was a commissioner of the Independent Media Commission to ensure fairness in the media during the first uh, democratic election. One of the great things about uh, our, our democracy is it's enabled us to relook at our history. And Zubeda has done that more than most. She's written three books. The first was called Our Generation, which was a, a, really a memoir uh, about her time in the apartheid era, including uh, being on the run with her then husband, Johnny Issel, who was a famous activist and later became an ANC MP. Um, she's now written, uh, she's written two books since then, uh, on Trial with Mandela, uh, which is the life story of Ayesha Dawood and has just been reissued uh, as a hardback. But her new book is called Beauty of the Heart, and it's about the life and times of Charlotte Makeka. Makeka. And um, welcome, Zubeda. And tell us, why did you write a book about Charlotte Makeka? Uh, John, thank you. It's lovely to be here with you. Uh, um, Charlotte, there was a memorial lecture to Charlotte at the University of the Free State when I started there a few years ago, and I knew so little about her. And then in conversation with uh, the then director, Jonathan Jansen, he then said, uh, well, there's generally, you know, not a lot known about her, and wouldn't I consider, you know, writing a book about her life? And I agreed without hesitation. Well, she's famous... She was a f she was had a lot of firsts. She was the first uh, South African African woman uh, graduate. That's right. She she I mean, in, way back in 1901, she graduated at Ohio in the United States, and it was an extraordinary feat for a young girl from from the Eastern Cape. Um, and there were virtually no white women South Africans who, who were graduates. Yes, it was a handful of uh, white women. And, and her degree was in science. It was a BSc, and um, the white women who graduated then were, you know, like the mayor's daughter, the mayor of Cape Town's daughter, and various uh, women who came from solid, you know, middle class families, I would imagine. But Charlotte came from a very, you know, humble family, and uh, her father was illiterate, he became literate, and, but her mother was a teacher. So, so she, for her to reach, and become like a graduate at that time, it's, it's quite an amazing feat. And her route, her route to success and to opportunity was singing. Yes, the music and singing. She, be, she was a member of a choir, a church choir, which was called uh, the Jubilee Choir. And she was, they were very influenced, uh, those people living in Kimberley, where she was at that stage, a young teacher. Uh, they were very influenced by the McAdoo, the Jubilee Choir, uh, that came from the United States. Orpheus McAdoo. Orpheus McAdoo. Who, who became known to Cape Tonians when uh, David Kramer's show, Orpheus in Africa, was performed. Yes, I was just, you know, amazed when David um, produced that film. I'm just, I was just a little bit sorry that, the, you know, there was no mention of Charlotte. Yes. But I understand, because I had discussed it with him, and he said that, you know, he had to zoom in into sort of, he couldn't extend it all over the show. It's always the problem. Yeah, but, um, but it was amazing because it was that time and it was that uh, troupe of singers that influenced our people in Kimberley to start a similar choir. And then, you know, they were invited to go abroad. And that took her to England where yes. she landed up uh, with her choir uh, singing for Queen Victoria in, right. in 1891. Yes, that's right, 1891. Tell and us about that, e that event. It was, it, was, it was interesting. Well, there were a number of elements, and the one element was that 
just before they were due to go and sing or, you know, in preparation for the singing uh, at various places, the organizers decided to change their name from Jubilee Choir to Kaffir Choir. And Charlotte and her sister and the others, the rest of them, there were 24 altogether, they objected vociferously. But they were just told, no, the British would know, you know, what the Kaffir Choir meant. And, and, and they were, you know, they were really insulted by, by this change, but couldn't do anything about it. And the other, uh, I mean, she seemed to meet a real uh, panoply of interesting people, including Emily Pankhurst, who later would, would become the, the founder of the suffragette movement in England. Charlotte, well, you know, I'm, I was fascinated as I uncovered and realized, you know, how her life, the trajectory of her life, because she landed up in England at that time when, when Emily Pankhurst and her people were active. But how, I mean, how extraordinary that she actually met her and sat with her. And, and that was her. before she became famous. She was 20, 21. Yes. Uh, no, not necessarily. No, no, Emily was already an activist. But yes, but the suffragette movement hadn't really got uh, it. Had oh, got oh, it had okay. off. Yeah, it had yeah. got it off the ground. So she she um, met with with Emily Pankhurst, and that for me was also very unusual because she's just a, you know. It's an extraordinary story that we know so little about it. Uh, of course, we're going to talk a little further about her, how, her political role because she became politically extremely important, and in fact founded the precursor to the ANC Women's League. Yeah, she, she founded the Bantu Women's League in 1917 at the end of the First World War. And uh, she was at the forefront through the Bantu Women's League of opposing, you know, the past laws for women. And till today I find it puzzling why we, you know, generally didn't know this, you know. Is that because we foreground in, in our history the ANC uh, uh, institutions, and this was a pre-ANC institution. It could be that, it could be that, but I still think that it's strange. I don't have a, I can speculate, but I don't have a sort of a, I can't say definitively that, oh, she was ignored because, you know, uh, the ANC didn't allow women in its organization. But she was the first, she, she was the only woman to be present at the launch of the ANC in 1912 at, in Bloemfontein. But she couldn't be a member because women were not allowed. No, she couldn't be a member. We have to take a break on that note. We'll be right back. And we're back talking to Zubeda Jaffa. I want to take a step back and look at uh, her time in America because that also was a very rich period. Uh, she was lectured by W.E.B. Du Bois, the uh, very famous African-American thinker. That is also quite extraordinary that she should land there just sort of at the time when he was a teacher there and also that she should land at a, at a university that was for the first, for the free the first free slaves. Um, African American. African American University. African American University, yeah. and she was caught up in the middle of those those debates, you know. That was at Wilberforce. That was at Wilberforce in Ohio, and we W. E. B. Du Bois was engaged with, uh, with with the discussions around whether one should just do better as an individual, and many people should do better. And if you do better as an individual, then, you know, things will improve. In an economic sense. That's. And, you know, the, the argument was there was one tra train of thought. And then W.E.B. Du Bois was of the view that, um, that no, people should have an organization. And they Political be, organization. Yeah, and they should be supported yes. in what they're trying to achieve. Yes. And South Africans, or Charlotte and other South Africans were exposed to both these views and various other views that were going around at the turn of the century. And uh, as Pella Jordan says in the book, they took for what, you know, they took what they, what elements, they wanted, yeah. elements of, of that. Yes. But just imagine, she was exposed to that and she was a very good friend of the, the student 
that became the wife of W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh -huh. And so he keeps an eye on her, on, on Charlotte, and he eventually uh, writes uh, a piece which I have in the book about her. And uh, she also was, was close to people who then founded the ANC later. Yes, she was. And, and they were also overseas, because most of them had American or British degrees themselves by the time they launched the ANC. Well, in, and in some way the connection was Kimberley. Kimberley yes. was very, very important, because, you know, with the discovery of diamonds, you know, many people moved to Kimberley. And so the, a lot like Sarplaiki, they were all in that and facility. And she knew, of course. And yes, and so she was sort of in that intellectual circle. And those were the people who, um, under Odendal in his book, The Founders, actually uh, write about in earlier than the launch of the ANC, you know, the late 1800s, 1890s, and then 1902, with the first organization that was started. Uh, which is the precursor to the ANC. I must say, it was an excellent book, uh, The Founders, by Andre Unendal. Yes. We haven't recommended it here, but we should. It really gives it an is. insight into the people who became the ANC. Yeah, I'm really sad about it because he, you know, they, he only, they only printed 2,000 books. Yes. And it's a book that should be, uh, if not just everywhere, oh, yeah. in, on, on the shelves of any serious, uh, you know, politico and any serious... Uh, a teacher, yes. you know, history teacher. Um, it's just an amazing book. Yes, I'm glad you mentioned it. I'm going to recommend it on the show. Maybe we'll get him onto the show as well. Now, the other dimension that was also interesting that influenced her in America was religious, because she came into contact with the AME Church, yes. which then for the first time came over here and started here. You see, they were abandoned, uh, the choir when they were in... That is African Methodist Episcopal, Episcopal. Church. <laughs> yeah. the, the, they were abandoned, uh, the choir, uh, uh, twice. Once in Britain and in, in America once in again. America. Yeah. So then it was in the newspapers, there was a report that they'd been abandoned. And then the African, uh, the Amy Church, African Methodist Episcopalian Church, they stepped up to the plate and they... In, and decided to invite Charlotte and a few others as well to come and study at Ohio, at Wilberforce. And then Charlotte kind of got introduced to, to the church and got, you know, in fact, almost adopted by the Women's Might Missionary um, uh, Association, which was the women's section of the, of the Amy Church. And they kind of saw to her, you know, while she was abroad. And she could have stayed there and become part of that community. Yes, a she... In a, quite a sort of leadership position. She, she could have, but her big passion from a young girl was from about 10, on the record, that she was saying that she's going to get... She's going to study, she's going to go overseas, she's going to study, and she's going to come back to educate her father's people. Because her father had been illiterate, you see. And she didn't think it was, it was funny when, um, when he told some of the stories of, you know, how scared he was of the written word and that. She said, oh. no, she's going, to, she's going to make sure that. And so the, one of the first things she did when she came back, she went back to Ramakopa village, which is where he's from, in the, in the Popo, and she started teaching the herd boys at night, night school, and she started um, building a church and she started... You know, she started her uh, educational work in that little village up north. We I hope to go and, you know, I, I visited there. I hope to go again to go and launch the book. And uh, she also uh, uh, later married uh, Marshall, who came from, who, who had become a graduate at Wilberforce as well. Yes. Uh, but he was a few years younger than her. Yes, and he went a few years later. So, well, he went, no, not a few years later. He went sort of, but after her. After her. And so he also came back as a, as a member of the church and a priest in the Amy Church. And they, had, uh, they ended up having political differences? It's not on the record of what, whether they personally had differences, but definitely her husband had differences with the ANC and then started another organization. Uh, called the, what is it called, the middle path or something. I can't remember exactly. 
but he started another organization and this must have created you know some tension um, and because she continued to work sort of quite closely with you know uh, the leadership of the ANC. Now you you found pictures which we're going to put put on show to uh, um, some that hadn't been seen for for over a hundred years, including this one of uh, her graduation day at Wilberforce. We'll show it there. That's that's it, and then also um, uh, a, a, a statue that has been put up in the National Heritage Monument yes, of her. Yes. Uh, these are remarkable pictures you managed to find. Well, you know the book. Uh, it's like somebody's commented that. The pictures alone sort of, uh, you, know, you know, tells the whole story because the pictures haven't been seen for 125 years. Yeah. And uh, the, the, these are studio pictures that were taken in the, Uni in the, in the United Kingdom in Britain uh, when the choir went to sing. So these, uh, there were some one or two pictures that have been seen, like the choir picture has been seen before, but it's always a bit grainy. But and that one I've just shown you has, has not? No, and uh, no, the, 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 the graduation, graduation picture. picture, no, no, no. The graduation picture came straight from the university, and, uh, but that isn't a studio, well it was, but it's not a high quality <coughs> picture, but, the, but it's the first time ever that we've seen a graduation picture. We have to stop there, we'll be right back. And we're back talking to Zubeda Jaffa. Zubeda, before we get on to talk a little bit about whether there are lessons in her life for the present, I do want to go back to one uh, thing you write about in the book that I found rather uh, significant, and that is her times when they sang for Queen Victoria. There was this remarkable way that they saw it in that time. The first half, she uh, she is presented with all, all these, the choir, all in African dress. Yes, they, they, they first were in the African dress and then they had to change into the... And then they sang African songs. Yes, yes. oh yeah, okay. And then they break and then they come, come back. And then they dressed in European clothes and they've got to sing European songs. And, Chris, and religious songs. Yeah, and religious songs. And uh, what was so amazing, Firstly, they, it, it, was, it was, well, they handled it, but what was interesting was that, that people couldn't believe that, uh, that's, people couldn't believe that the songs that they were singing were of such a high quality, the mm. African songs that they were singing. Ah. And so there was a, a, a critical comment in some music review that said, you know, how can Africans be, you know, it sounds like the, you know, some uh, important piece of European music and then um, and suggested that it couldn't really be their own music. And then the, one of the organizers of the, of the choir wrote back and said that, you know, this is their own music, this is what they produced mm -hmm. themselves and this has been with them for many, many years. It's a ro remarkable little vignette into how uh, Victorian England, uh, colonial England, imperial England, uh, looked, looked, looked at South Africans? Well, it's the same as it is today. The, you know, it's looked at through a very, very fine lens or a little a closed lens. Yeah. And yet we are, you know, we are like this. Yes. And yet some people only see that. Right. I now want to jump uh, back to the present. Uh, she was a, a pioneer of, 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 women's, uh, of a women's league prior to the ANC Women's League. She was a powerful person. She was educated. Uh, I have a quote from her, her that's rather interesting. Uh, and she's talking about um, uh, relationships between witch doctors and alcohol and things like that. And she says, far worse to my people than witch doctors are the ravages of strong drink with the Christian nations pouring to my country. Rather would I be at the mercy of a witch doctor than under the misgovernment of an intemperate ruler. Uh, now, that's an interesting quote, and of course she's talking about alcohol, which doesn't necessarily apply to us here. But what do you think she would say about our current times? You know, she, if you read through the book carefully, you'll find that some of the comments that she makes are quite extraordinary. And the fact that she, 
that it was, rec I mean, that she had written it down, you know, that's also extraordinary. But I think she often spoke very sharply into uh, the co her own community. She didn't hold back. She, she, didn't, she wasn't scared to do that. And I c could not imagine her uh, being part of a women's organization that um, defends, you know, the kind of behavior that, for example, we've seen from our president. Uh, and, you know, just I can't see that at all. She was very big on integrity, very big on dig being dignified. In fact, the word, the title of the book is Beauty of the Heart. She talks about beauty of the heart, you know, the importance to be, the importance to be dignified and to find, you know, that sort of, uh, to cleanse your heart. Mm -hmm. And so for her, the women's organization issue is that she believed in independent women's organization. And I mean, I've been watching what's been happening over the last year or two, and I'm appalled every time, you know, the first people who come out in support of anything that the president does the, is the Women's League. And I, would, I don't think Charlotte would have been, you know, would have been part of that. It's not their job to do that. Their job is to stand up for us as women. Mm -hmm. And uh, they did it very beautifully with the Oscar trial, where they were yes. there to support Riva Steenkamp's family. And I thought that is the right role. But you can't be caught up in not being definitive about you know, issues of polygamy and how it should be handled, and issues of rape and how it should be handled, and issues of impropriety and how it should be handled. And I'm sorry they've, you know, they've actually, you know, misstepped here in a big way, which is sad. Well, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's all we have on Charlotte Makeka and the beauty of the heart. It's, it's very well worth reading. We have a, a, a last minute just to talk a little bit about your earlier book, which has just been reissued. And I must say, I find the cover particularly beautiful on trial with Mandela about uh, Ayesha Dawood. Can you just give us in, uh, in 30 seconds a um, uh, story of why you thought this was important to write? This is the story of Aisha Dawood, which was released in South Africa as Love in the Time of Treason. I've relaunched it now uh, as On Trial with Mandela internationally because I feel it's such an amazing love story. It's a strong woman, again, a woman from the, from the Worcester area. And uh, to show the kind of efforts that were made uh, and the kind of integrity that, in, uh, that you found, because she could have stayed in South Africa if she'd agreed to spy on the ANC. So she wasn't prepared to do that, and so she was given an exit permit for 23 years. And I think these stories are very important for us now to, to, to think about and to reflect on, you know, uh, when we're living in a time when, the, when people don't know right from wrong or being shown that they, you know, they're not clearly shown what is right and what is wrong. And uh, so I do think we will get through this period, but it's a shameful period for us, you know. And um, I hope that especially Charlotte's book will sort of give people courage again to, to stand up and be true to themselves. Well, thank you. That's uh, Zubaydah Jaffa. Uh, the two books are very well worth reading. On Trial with Mandela, The Life Story of Ayesha Dawood, and Beauty of the Heart, The Life and Times of Charlotte Makeda. <laughs> uh, well, that's, that's it for us tonight. I'm John Madison. Uh, good night and happy reading.